Hello and welcome to the New York City Category Theory Seminar. There's a little feedback here, but uh, we're going to get over that in a second. Tonight we have a special guest, Robert uh, Garach. Um, he wrote this book, the first Category Theory book that I ever read, and I loved it, and I learned a tremendous amount from it. It's called Mathematical Physics, and uh, it really came out early. And uh, he wrote a few other books, but one of them is called geometrical quantum mechanics and then he has relativity theory from a to b <laughs> which is a great title by the way um uh, so he's at university of chicago and he's going to tell us a little bit about himself like uh, where he got his degree and how he got interested in category theory and how he got uninterested in category theory and then and then he could start talking like an alien Anyways, Robert, take it away. But before you take it away, lower your lower your your volume so that uh, the the background is gone. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I, I um, graduated in physics, and my I almost all work in relativity, and I don't really remember how I got interested in category theory. Um, it seemed like I, I guess I taught a course in in it, and it seemed like a way to organize the ideas in the course. But in that little book, there's nothing deep. It's all just little definitions of of, of, of billion topological groups or whatever. And you, you took um, a course from McLean. Um, I have to turn the sound up to hear you. Who who did you take the course from McLean in in Chicago? No, no, I, I taught the course. Ah. It was a choice I taught, and I was going to teach a course in mathematical physics, and I thought, well, it would be fun to do it this way, but that was, uh, um, I never really worked in category theory, so, and I, I, <laughs> I haven't exactly left it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Anyhow, I, I do have to say it has a lot of mathematical physics. The book has, you know, a lot of interesting things, but very little on relativity theory. Uh, true, that's true. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to uh, reality here. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how many of you saw the, the news this morning, but it was announced that we've made contact with a, with a civilization um, on the other side of the galaxy. And they discovered how to transmit signals faster than light, so we're actually able to hold a conversation with these people in real time. But the really surprising thing is that we've been in contact with them for two years now. But it was all hush-hush for some um, security reason. So but now the transcripts of the entire two years have been released. And what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about what's in those transfers. And, 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 uh, well, it began with, uh, with, with, with um, sort of... Uh, uh, easy things, uh, what they like, um, they have three sexes, by the way, what their society is like, what their religion is, and so on. But then the discussion turned to mathematics and physics. And the, the sense then was this is going to be easy, because after all, mathematics and physics are out there somewhere. They're not really part of, of society, and therefore, presumably, the aliens and we have the same ideas about mathematics and physics. But it turned out that there was a surprise. And I, I read in particular the transcripts for this discussion of mathematics and physics, and what I'd like to tell you is what that surprise was. Maybe I should start with a caution. The fact is that it's easier for us to understand their mathematics than it is for them to understand our mathematics. Well, the first indication that there was going to be a problem came with the Euler proof that there's an infinite number of primes. Um, I'm sure everyone knows the proof. Given an integer n, consider the integer n factorial plus 1. If you divide that integer by anything from 2 to n, the remainder will be 1 by construction. Therefore, none of the numbers 2 through n divide this number, n factorial plus 1. And therefore, the prime divisors of this number must be primes greater than n. That is to say, for every n, there's a prime greater than n. That's Euler's theorem. 
Um, but it was, it, 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 but when we discussed this, they have the proof, of course, but when we discussed the thing, then there was a kind of a roadblock, because we would say, well, so for every n, there exists a prime greater than n, and they would say, we have a proof of that, and we'd say, so there's no largest prime, and they'd say, um, we have a proof of that, and we'd say, there's an infinite number of primes, and they'd say, yeah, we have a proof of that. For them, mathematics is only the formalism of mathematics. They don't assign any reality behind what one does in mathematics. So one's immediate reaction is that maybe this is just an issue of language. Um, maybe that they just use the word true in a slightly different way than we do, but there's no real substance to this apparent difference. But it emerged from further discussions of mathematics that there really are um, um, there, there really are differences in this point of view. And what I want to do is describe to you what that those differences are. So let me um, um, back up and talk about what the mathematics of the aliens is. They have computers. And they have a computer language, and it's like our computer languages, like Fortran, or all, all our computer languages are the same. And they can write programs in those languages, in their language, and those programs are like our programs. They have the opportunity to input strings. They, um, they, 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 they sometimes output strings. The computer may or may not have. So they have all of that equipment. Their shtick is that they assign the words true and false only to sentences of the following form. This specific program with this specific input halts at this specific number of steps with this specific output. We must specify all those explicitly. They're willing for such a sentence to say, yeah, that's true, or yeah, that's false. But they refuse to assign the words true or false to anything else. In other words, for them, true and false is only applicable to things that we can actually check to sort of routine um, um, activities. For example, the statement, uh, but, but a statement like, this program never halts, or there exists an input for which that program halts, for them, you can make such statements, but they don't describe any truth value at all to those statements. So, for example, the statement 17 is prime is, for them, a statement that true, the words true and false apply to, and it's true. On the other hand, the statement, given any n, there's a prime greater than n. They simply don't have any notion of what that means to say that that, that, that statement is true. Their view of mathematics is a little like uh, the, the constructive mathematics that we have. You can, there's a lot of versions of constructive mathematics, but in one of them, a number, for example, is a rule that assigns to each integer n a certain rational number, such that the rational number, the sequence of rational numbers that you get, is a Cauchy sequence in the following sense. Given the nth number and the nth number, the difference of those two rationals is less than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 over n. In other words, for, for the constructivists, a number is a sort of um, uh, control rash, um, um, Cauchy sequence. But then for the constructivists, the statement, given any two numbers A and B, either A, or they have a notion of a, a number greater than another number. A number A is greater than a number B, provided there exists an N and an M, such that the nth rational approximation to the first number, A, and the nth rational approximation to the second number, B, is greater than 1 over M plus 1 over M. In other words, if the Cauchy sequences have no chance of converging to the same number. So, for the constructors, the statement A is greater than B, or A is equal to B, or A is less than B, the statement that one of those three things holds for every choice of the number A and B is not proven. 
because for them, in order to claim that one of three things is true, you have to give a constructive procedure for deciding which of the ones is true. But if I only give you the numbers A and B, that is, if I only stand ready to tell you what the rationals are for any choice of, of N, and I do it for both A and B, that's not enough information for you to decide whether A is greater than B, A is equal to B, or A is less than B. This has kind of shades of the mathematics that these aliens use, because, the, the, um, the, because we're not allowed to say abstract things, we're only allowed to talk about things you can do in some sense. But in a way, and not in a way, but in fact, the aliens are much more constructivist than the constructivists. Because, for example, if a constructivist says a number is, is a rule that assigns to each integer n a certain rational number, if it says that, the, the aliens are going to say, I don't know what that means. What you, I want you to make it as a statement that a certain program with a certain input string halts in a certain number of steps with a certain output string. And all of this for all n business, we don't know what that means. So that the aliens, in some sense, are more are, are sort of hyper-constructive um, um, beings. Well, we can make other statements about programs. For example, we, we can say a program never halts, or that a program halts with some input. Um, and the aliens recognize such statements as statements, but they don't assign to them any true, true or false values. However, they are able to encode such statements as strings, so they can write down a string that represents this program never halts. Um, they also have what they call their proof program. And their proof program has the following structure. You input the string that represents one of these assertions, and the, the, the um, proof program chugs along. It may halt and say, proven. It may never halt. Um, so the, 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 the statement that this proof, proof program on this statement string halts in 167 steps with the output proven, that's a statement that they recognize and they can say this is true or this is false. So, they, so they, it is meaningful for them to say we have a proof a la our proof program. We have a proof of the statement. But again, they don't recognize the statement as itself being true. Um, they, 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 um, so they, 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 they accept the uh, truth for this is proof, but not, for example, the statement there exists no proof. An assertion, because there exists no proof of an assertion, says that the proof program run on that assertion will never halt, and they don't have a notion of never halt. Well, they um, emailed us their proof program, and we've parsed it, and we understand how their proof program works. So let me tell you our interpretation of their proof program. Um, we can introduce integers. And we, we and, um, um, and and we can encode we, we can encode their programs as integers. If they take any one of their programs, it's a finite string of characters, and we can encode it as an integer. And statements they make about their programs, for example, doesn't halt. We can encode that as an assertion about integers. Well, we have a scheme for dealing with integers and their assertions. It's called of piano arithmetic. And recall how piano arithmetic works. We posit the integers, first of all, and we have some axioms on the integers. There are things every integer has a successor, um, zero is not the successor of any integer, some mild axioms about integers. We have the ability to make assertions about integers. For example, there exists an integer n such that for all integers n, it's not the case that this integer times that integer has this property, except in the, so on and so on. We can make such statements. Finally, we have these kind of stylized proofs of these statements in which you basically use the logic of there exists and for all and not and so on, and you use the axiom of piano arithmetic, and we get 
the uh, arithmetic for um, for the integers. So we have that subject. And now the, 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 what we've discovered is that their proof program is precisely the same as the following. Take their assertion, take their statement about a program, for example, this program never has, convert it to an assertion about integers, and then search for a piano proof of that assertion about integers. And if you find a piano proof of that assertion about integers, report prove it. And if you don't find the piano proof, you continue looking. That is, in fact, the mechanism of their proof program, according to us. So let me um, uh, um, illustrate this with, with, with um, Goldbach's conjecture. So recall what Goldbach's conjecture is. It says every even integer greater than two is the sum of two primes. So for us, we say, well, let me do it for them. For them, they say, okay, I can take that statement, every even integer is the sum of greater than two is the sum of two primes. I can look for, I can put that statement into my proof program. And I, um, I and in fact, we, we've done that 113 years ago. It started, it's still running, and well, we're still waiting. It hasn't happened yet. We can also take the assertion, it is false that for every um, um, even integer greater than two can be written as the sum of two primes. And they, we can take that assertion, we put that on our proof program, that's been going for 87 years, and well, the, the jury's still out on that one too. So that would be the, the, their position, if you like, on Goldbach. Um, let me tell you the, the, the sort of things we might say about Goldbach. Well, the first statement is, if the Goldbach conjecture is false, then there exists a proof that the Goldbach conjecture is false. Because if the Goldbach conjecture is false, i.e., if there is an even number, say 158, which cannot be written as the sum of two primes, then we can prove that Goldbach is false by simply displaying that number and noticing that it's not the sum of two primes. So, if Goldbach is false, we can prove there exists a proof that Goldbach is false. But if there exists a proof that Goldbach is false, then Goldbach is false, because we've proven it. That is to say, the Goldbach conjecture is false if and only if there's a proof that is that is false. So, now we can restate that as a statement about programs, and it would be the following statement. Let's take a program that searches for a counterexample to the Goldbach conjecture. That is to say, it searches even numbers beginning with four, and in each case tries to write that number as the sum of two primes. That, and if, if and when that program will halt if it finds such a number. Let's also take a, a, um, um, a, a, a program that looks for a proof that Goldbach is false, a proof in piano arithmetic. Then what we're saying is, if you, um, if, if you run those two programs at the same time, then either both will halt, i.e., you'll find your counterexample and you'll have a proof that Goldbach is false, or neither will halt. That's our statement. Well, I invite you to try to find a proof of that statement in piano arithmetic. I don't, I don't know of one, and I'm not sure that there is one. So, for us, Goldbach is a sort of intertwining of true, false, exists a proof, this program halts, this one doesn't halt. But for the aliens, um, the, 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 the only statements they ever make are this program with this input counts in this number of steps without an input. Well, there's other things in mathematics besides the integer. For, the, for example, there's set theory, there's analysis, there's topology, there's category theory. Um, and the aliens have all of these, all of these objects. They are allowed to make, they can make assertions in set theory by simply introducing corresponding characters as an element of, subset of, and so on. Um, they can make assertions in set theory. They can write out the strings that represent assertions in set theory. They have the zermelo frankel proof um, program, which examines assertions made in set theory, looks for zermelo frankel proofs, that's, those are the axioms of set theory, 
that proves no affirmative proof of such an assertion, and if and when it finds such a proof, announces, voila, we have a proof of this assertion. But their view toward set theory is, is very much like their view toward the integers. For them, the statement, the zermelo frankel proof program um, for, on some assertion halts, i.e. there's a zermelo frankel proof, they're willing to accept that as true. So they, they acknowledge the existence of a proof, but they do not assign the word true at all to anything about set theory. That is to say, the assertions in set theory, just like the assertions in arithmetic, they don't assign truth by absolutes. They also have the axiom of choice, of course, and they have a proof program for zermelo frankel plus the axiom of choice. So, for example, this proof program applied to the assertion every vector space has a basis, um, the, the, then um, will halt, saying, yes, we have a zermelo frankel plus um, axiom of choice proof that every vector space has a, a basis. But Again, there's no issue for them of whether the axiom of choice is true or false. It just doesn't make any sense to them because that cannot be formulated in the language of the things for which they accept truth or falseness. Indeed, I think in this case, we're actually becoming coming a little closer to the aliens. I haven't taken a survey, but it's my guess that if you take, you take a survey of all mathematicians and ask them the question, is it meaningful to say that the axiom of choice is true or that the axiom of choice is false? I'm not asking whether it is the case that it's true or false. I'm asking whether it's meaningful. My guess is that a majority would say that it is not. Furthermore, and while I'm guessing, I also suspect that the number who feel that it's not is growing over time. So the, if, uh, this is the, my theory, anyway. So we're moving toward the idea that 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 the words true and false don't, simply don't apply to the axiom of choice. Well, in some sense, the aliens are way out in front of this. They want the words true and false not only to to not apply to the axiom of choice, but to apply to 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 not apply to to the statement this computer program halts, for example. Well, all of this is kind of benign. I mean, it's more about how you feel about things. But when we get to the Girdle theorem, I think the difference becomes much more pronounced. So here's the Girdle theorem. It says, given any proof program, there exists an assertion G with the following property. G is true if and only if the proof program applied to G, the one that's looking for a proof, fails to halt. That's Gödel's theorem. And that's proven in piano arithmetic. You give me any proof program you want, then I can design an assertion such that the assertion is true if and only if the proof program applied to that assertion halts. Furthermore, the assertion G is not one of these fancy fancy things about the axiom of choice or something. The assertion G is an assertion about the halting of a computer program. G says essentially some program or other, some explicit program doesn't halt. So we all, I think, believe that such a statement is either true or false. If I tell you this program halts, I think we would all say, okay, it's either false or it doesn't halt. So that's either true or false. So um, 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 Gödel produces an assertion G, which we all believe is either true, has a truth value. We do. The aliens aren't so into that. And, th and then th th this has a remarkable property that that assertion is true if and only if the proof, proof program fails to find a proof of it. So here, I'd like to suggest anyway, is, um, um, uh, is, is the way we think of Gurdle's theorem, at least people I talk to think of Gurdle's theorem. Let's start with a case where the proof program is the piano proof program. So it looks, like, it looks for a simple proof using integers and the axioms of integers and so on. Um, then um, Gurdle guarantees an assertion G such that G is true if and only if the search for a proof of G um, fails to halt. 
Okay, so that's all very fine. Now let's ask the question, if we run the piano proof program on this sentence G, on this sentence that's produced by the model, will it halt or will it not halt? Well, suppose that the proof program halts, then G is false, because that's what the the Girdle theorem says. So we'll now have a piano proof of something that's false, but we all believe that the piano axioms are about as benign as you can get. If the piano axioms were to prove something was false, I think it so disrupts our thinking about logic and mathematics, we're basically out of business. We just don't believe that that's going to happen. So the, the case where the, where, where the, where the, where the, 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 the proof program applied to G halts is basically ridiculous. So it must be the case that the proof program applied to G does not halt, and G is true. In other words, what Bill is producing for us is a statement, an assertion that is true, but for which the Piano proof program applied to that assertion fails to halt. In other words, it's an assertion that's true, but which can't be proved in piano arithmetic. Well, you might think, okay, maybe that's not so bad. After all, piano arithmetic is a kind of a constrained thing. Maybe it just needs to be beefed up a little bit. Why don't we kick in a couple more axioms and see if we can get things rolling here? After all, all we're asserting is that there's some assertion that is true, but piano arithmetic doesn't pick up as a proof. If maybe if we add more axioms, things will work out. But of course, the Girdle theorem guarantees that it's never going to work out because you can add axioms so you're blue in the face to the piano um, arithmetic, to the piano proof program, and the Girdle theorem will still find an assertion which is true if and only if your proof program fails to harm. So the statement is there exists true assertions that are not provable by any formalism, by any taking of piano arithmetic and adding things that you happen to like. Well, so here's the way, at least I understand, that people tend to interpret the Google thing. Humans have some special insight, because we can see that these statements are true, even though no formalism can establish that they're true. So humans are kind of special characters in this universe. We, have, we, can, kind of, we can perceive a level of truth that's not accessible by any formalism. Um, uh, for example, then, we might conclude that there's no mechanism, um, uh, there's no mechanical description uh, of people. You can't describe people by little wheels and, and gears and levers and so on, because if you could, those people so constructed would presumably not be able to appreciate the truth of anything that can't be described by a formalism, since gears and pulleys and levers and so on are presumably formalistically described. So some people say, the Girdle theorem says, that, um, that, that human beings are so special, have so much insight into truth, that it, we could never be explained in, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of mechanics. Other people say that maybe this has to do with quantum mechanics. With quantum mechanics, in, and after all, we're quantum beings, endows us with this special power to see, um, 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 uh, to see what's happening, to, to see these true things. Well, the, the response to the aliens to this is, why bother with all that, that, that stuff? They're willing to take the sentence, given a proof program, they're willing to take a sentence, there exists an assertion G, such that G is true, if and only if the proof program on G fails to halt, they'll take that sentence, they'll apply their piano proof program to it, the piano proof program will say proven, so after all, that's what it did, so they'll say, okay, that's proven, next, what's the problem? In other words, by denying the notion of truth, they're kind of off the, the, the notion of truth as applied to these uh, these other issues, these um, um, computer halt kind of issues. By denying that, they're really off the hook on on Girdle. In a similar kind of vein, um, 
the, um, the, a, a kind of extension of Gödel is that the, 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 there exists a proof that the piano arithmetic is consistent, if and only it's not the case that piano arithmetic is consistent. That's another uh, a consequence of Gödel's theorem. The statement is you can prove consistency of piano arithmetic, if and only if consistency of piano arithmetic fails. The failure of consistency of, of piano arithmetic would mean that you could prove the one equals zero in piano arithmetic. That would be inconsistent. Well, that sounds like a, a, a strange and mystical thing, but it isn't really that strange. Suppose that, it's, that, that piano arithmetic is inconsistent. That is to say, suppose that you can prove in piano arithmetic that zero equals one. Then you can prove anything. For example, theorem, pigs can fly, Proof, suppose for contradiction that pigs couldn't fly, blah, 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 one equals zero, that's a contradiction. Therefore, pigs can fly. If piano arithmetic is not consistent, we can prove anything. So in particular, we can prove the consistency of piano arithmetic. So this, this theorem, the statement that there exists a proof of consistency of piano arithmetic, if and only if piano arithmetic is not consistent, half of this is obvious. The other half is the, is the, um, is the, uh, uh, is the tricky part. So the, 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 um, so, so the, the statement about consistency is the following then. We can make a program that, that looks for piano proofs of 1 equals 0. And according to us, one of two things will happen. Either that program will eventually halt saying, I found one, or that program will never halt. This is what we say. And therefore, we say either piano arithmetic is consistent, the program never halts, or the piano arithmetic is not consistent, the program halts with 1 equals 0. And we actually discuss, I've discussed with people whether piano arithmetic is consistent or not. But the aliens don't, um, uh, uh, um, uh, don't have such discussions at all. For, for them, the statement piano arithmetic is consistent is not, a, is not something that they're willing to, to assign the word true to. Because for piano, they actually have a program that's been looking for piano proof that one equals zero. Um, and it's been going for, for 19 years now. And well, it's, they're still working on it. But maybe it'll go for 160 years. Maybe it'll go for 3,000 years. They'll never be able to say piano arithmetic is consistent. And if they can never say it, then they don't think it. They, they, they have only the things they can actually touch and feel. Well, let me try to summarize their, their, um, their position. And this is pra practically, um, this is word for word from the transcribed discussion. We say, there's no largest prime. And they say, what makes you think so? And we say, well, we can prove it. And they say, using what? And we say, piano arithmetic. And they say, so do you feel that anything you can prove in piano arithmetic is true? And we say, um, yeah. And they say, well, then suppose that it turns out that piano arithmetic is inconsistent, and that you can also prove that there's a largest prime. Will you then go around saying, well, I guess it's true that there's a largest prime. Well, I guess we say, well, cross that bridge when we get to it. Their position is that we use the word true for two very distinct senses. On the one hand, we say things are true if we can check them, if we can check that something is a proof of something. On the other hand, we, we, we say that things are, are true if we just feel they're true. So the statement that there's really a largest prime for the, from them is really a statement about our feelings and not a statement about primes. For them, the statement about primes is the proof of the Euler theorem. For them, they feel that this whole um, expanded notion of truth is a sort of shared intuition that is kind of, um, of, of, of cultural and that, that, that we're all raised into it and that we, we lock in and then eventually we kind of get stuck with it. And I think that, that, that and part of their evidence for that is that it's very difficult, I claim, to explain what you mean 
by this really an infinite number of primes to someone who doesn't already have that notion. Imagine someone who was raised by wolves and they, do, they, they never, got, never got around to uh, people very much. And imagine trying to explain that, what, what that means. I mean, in fact, I, 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 I've done this experiment. My dog, Buddy, um, is, um, is able to check on um, piano proofs. You give a piano, put a piano proof down on the floor, he looks at it. If it's a legitimate piano proof, he wags his tail. And if it's not a piano proof, he growls. I have tried to explain to him what it means to say there really is an infinite number of primes, and I get nowhere. I say, well, there's a prime greater than 160, and he, he thinks the book is okay, and I say, and there's a prime greater than 6 million, and he thinks a little longer for that one, but that says, okay, so there's a prime greater than every number, and he says, I don't know which number is every number. I don't know what you're talking about. I've several times in, 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 in lunch discussions we used to have took this took this um, view and and I, I played the role of Buddy and had people trying to explain to me what it means and I claim that I just don't know how to explain it. I mean, I th I think that it really is a cultural um, a cultural thing, and according to the the um, aliens. That it's it's girdle the real, the girdle theorem which really that that, that, that really um, um, rubs our nose in the problems that we have with the notion of true as applied to these other statements. So they they like the girdle theorem because it kind of it it, it shows us that our intuition is clashing in some sense with reality. They furthermore point out. Well, this has happened before in physics and mathematics. For example, they claim, they've been monitoring radio for the levels, they claim that at one time it was believed that there are no levels of infinity. It's either really big as either infinity, or it's not infinity. But once you get infinity, you're infinity, and there's no further level. On the other hand, along came cardinality, and we had this intuition, at least I, I wasn't around at the time, but I presumably had this intuition that there's a single notion of infinity. Along comes cardinality, and we had to adjust our intuition to conform with, if you like, the reality of cardinality theory, um, and we did so. And it was a little tough at first, but once we made the transition, it wasn't so bad. To give another example, there was once, I presume, an intuition that a, that a particle has a position. Every particle has a, that, that's what particleness is all about. Particles have positions. But then along comes quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, par particles simply don't have positions. They're described by wave functions. And wave functions don't give rise to positions for the particles. So again, here was a conflict between what our intuition is about the, what particles are all about and what reality of quantum mechanics is. And the same thing happened again. We had to adjust our intuition. And by now that adjustment is, among physicists, I guess, is pretty nearly complete. Um, I, I think physicists don't have a sense that particles have positions in quantum mechanics. So what, what, what they're saying is, look, you learn to adjust your intuition for levels of infinity, you learn to adjust your, your, your intuition for particles and positions, adjust your intuition now for this. It is very hard to adjust your intuition. So, for example, let's consider a program that has only two lines. The first line inputs an integer, and the second line is halt. Okay. And I ask you, is it the case that this program halts for no matter what integer is put in? Well, obviously, the answer is yes. Okay. And so, um, the, the, uh, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a slightly more, less, less obvious program. It has maybe five steps. It's still obvious, but it ta it'll take you 30 seconds to realize it. And ask, does this program always halt? And you'll take 30 seconds. Yes. And now I'm going to, there's a slippery slope here. I'm now going to go through a succession of ever more complicated um, programs. And in each case, I'm going to ask you whether that program halts or not. 
And, 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 and I presume in each case you're going to say yes. And eventually I claim I can work you through small increments to the position that a program halts if there's a piano proof that it halts. But once I get you to that stage, then you're in trouble because the, um, the, the, um, you, you, you've got the problem that the piano may not be consistent. So um, you're, you're on this sort of slippery slope. You start with something where, where the statement it halts is obvious, and you end up with a problem. And it's very hard to know exactly where, the, where to draw the line. If somebody could tell me where to draw the line, on one side we say it's really true that it halts. On the other side we say, well, it's only some piano stuff that results in halts. But we're not actually that sure. That would be great, but I don't see where the line is going to be. So anyway, this, is, this was the speech that the aliens gave us. And um, I guess people were not entirely happy about it, but there was a sense that maybe we can escape this, this we can defend our position, we can defend our planet by turning to physics. So the thought was, let's see if we can find physics arguments that support our position, our position being that it's not so nonsensical to assign the word true to statements such as this program holds. So two argument, two physical arguments were produced uh, on, um, in this dialogue. So let me tell you what the two arguments were. The first argument was the following. How can you say, this is us speaking now, how can you say that it's meaningless to say that a, that a computer program halts or not when we can do an experiment to decide whether the, the program halts? So here's the experiment. There are in general relativity solutions of Einstein's equation, we have the following property. First, the solution contains a world line, i.e. a possible path for, that a computer could, could follow, contains a world line of infinite length, that is to say there's infinite amount of time available for that computer. And it contains a second, this based on contains a second world line, which is going to be the world line of the observer, and, and that, that world line will have the following property. There'll be some point P on that world line, some time, some moment on the life of that observer, such that at that moment, that observer was capable of receiving signals from the entire world line of the computer for all possible times in the computer. There's a moment, there is a space time that has this property. There's a world line for the computer, which goes on an infinite amount of time, a world line for an observer, but there's a specific moment on the observer's world line at which he's able to observe the computer in its entirety. So let's now do the following experiment. We'll set up the computer to check to see whether some program that we happen to be interested in um, holds or not. So program that checks for the um, consistency of piano arithmetic. So, and we'll, we'll, we'll wire things so that if that program falls, if it says, ah, I found the proof of consistency, for example, then it'll um, send out a signal, a radio signal that says, we found it, we found it. Then this observer, the observer world line, will, will, will watch for that signal. And if that signal is ever sent at any time in the time of the uh, computer world line, it will be seen by a specific time, by a specific point on, uh, on the world line of the, of the observer. So this observer at that point will be able to say either, well, I got the signal, that one haunts, or the important one is, I never got the signal, that program never haunts. So, we said to the aliens, here we are, we've described an experiment within general relativity which could decide whether or not programs halt. So how can we say that there's no reality to something that we can see experimentally? That's our position. Well, the, the um, aliens have two responses to that. One response is that there are experimental errors in this world. And if you want to have a specific point on your world line, Mr. Observer, if you want to have a moment when you can see the entire history of the computer, 
when it will necessarily be the case, since you have to use instruments of some finite sensitivity, it will be the case that if the signal is sent out sufficiently late by the, com by, by the computer, you won't be able to pick it up. You'll need more and more sensitive instruments. And you can't, if you had an infinite amount of time, you'd say, well, I'll get a sensitive one, and the next week I'll get a better one, and it'll get a better one, and I'll go on forever. But if you have to do everything by this point P, you will have some finite sensitivity at that point, and you won't be able to make the decision. So that's one of their arguments. They actually have a better argument than that, and the argument is the following. They can see that there exist spacetimes in general relativity which have this property. So they can see that even ignoring for a moment this issue of experimental accuracy, that um, the, 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 um, you could in principle see the entire history of the, of the computer. However, they point out the following theorem in general relativity. The theorem is every spacetime that has this character fails to have an initial data surface. That is, an initial data surface means the ability to set things up at some initial time that will result in these circumstances. Not every space-time in general relativity has initial data, and it's a theorem that these never do. So, what they're saying is, okay, you're so smart, you have your experiment, let's see you perform the experiment. How are we going to perform the experiment? Well, we're going to have to set up the initial data that will have the computer and the observer and the point P and the instruments and so on. We want to set that all up. We do that by setting initial data, but there's no initial data that will generate these place times. So if you'd like, general relativity conspires to take away from us this notion of true to, to, computer halt, to computer's halt and so, if you like, physics is, is siding with the aliens. Well, we make a second kind of, a kind of argument. And the second kind of argument is, look, in order to do physics, we have to do mathematics. And if we, if we don't have a notion of true, then we don't know what mathematics we're allowed to do. And as long as we're using mathematics to, 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 to elucidate physics, we need a notion of true to tell us what's going on. Let me give you an example. Okay. There's a theorem in general relativity that has the following structure. First, there's a notion of initial data in general relativity. It's initial conditions that are specified. And you can evolve that initial data in time. And in general, in general relativity, there's freedom in what the evolution is. You can evolve a great deal in one region and not so much in another region, or vice versa. There's a lot of poss possible evolutions of initial data. But there's a theorem in general relativity that says, nevertheless, there's a unique maximal evolution. There's a unique evolution which is as far as you can go in the evolution. And that's useful to know that. Because if you have a, if you're thinking about some issue in general relativity and you have some in, initial conditions, then it's nice to not to have to say, well, there's this evolution and that evolution. I don't know what I should do. Blah, blah. You don't have to. You just say, oh, let's go to the maximum evolution, and that's the most you can say about the space time from that initial data. So this is a theorem with some possible interest in general relativity. Well, here's how the proof goes. Proof goes, you take the initial data and you consider two evolutions. So one evolution, you evolve a lot this way and a little bit this way, the other one is a little and a lot. Some, and you have the notion of one evolution extending another. That is to say, you have one evolution, suppose you have a second one that goes that far and a little further. That's an ordering of the evolution, an ordering by inclusion, if you like. And what one proves is that that satisfies the conditions for Zorn's law. That is to say that every, if you have a totally ordered subset of, 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 of evolutions, you can smack them all together and get a maximal one, uh, get, get a maximal one for that totally ordered set. And therefore, applying Zorn's lemma, there exists a maximal evolution. That was the proof. I think, in fact, there's a proof without Zorn's lemma now. But anyway, for a long while, that was, that was the only proof. So, so we say to the aliens, we need to know whether the axiom of choice is true or not, because we need to, to know whether we have access to this statement about evolutions in, in relativity. 
So the, the more, and now comes the response of the aliens, they say, you don't need truth for this at all. Here's our version of what physics is. You go around and look at things, and then you want to correlate the various observations or predict observations or do some, do some, do whatever you do with observations. And that, the activity of correlating observations or looking at observations and so on, that activity involves um, um, some manipulation. So there are rules as parts of physical theories that say you take your observations and then you move these symbols around in this way and then you get some other observations or some predictions about observations and so on. It's not even necessary that this moving symbols around, the mechanism by which you get from, the ob from one observation to another, it doesn't even have to remotely look like mathematics. As long as it's a procedure, as long as it's a computer program that looks at the observations and makes the predictions, that's good enough to do physics. So, if, for example, your, your, your manipulations have a, a look like you're, 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 you're using the axiom of choice, that's great. You don't need that the axiom of choice is true. All you need is that the theory prescribes you do these manipulations, and they're sort of axiom of choice looking like, but the, 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 that's how you make the predictions. And you might make other predictions in other ways. In other words, the claim of the aliens is that true, the, the idea that mathematical assertions are true is of no real help in doing physics. I might add that there's an enterprise in physics to decide whether, for example, the axiom of choice is needed for various things that we use in physics. Uh, I mean, I guess that's of some interest in some sense. On the other hand, I don't think that the aliens would find this a particularly interesting subject because they're, they don't, they're willing to use anything. I mean, you make up axioms and write, write because as long as you're doing some manipulation that you connect to the, the observations, they're perfectly happy of that being a uh, um, law of physics. So in any case, that's the kind of status of this discussion that's taking place between the physicists on our planet and the, the alien physicists. And I'm sure that in the next two years, well, there's going to be lots more surprises that come from this, um, this dialogue, and I only wonder what they're going to be. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Wait a minute. I'm turning it on. Okay. It's called radical constructivism. Radical. That's very nice. Yeah, that's what it is. Andre, you have a question. <laughs> Wait, not yet. Yeah, let, let, let me think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> any, any questions whatsoever? <laughs> well, I, I can't call you a liar because I would be saying that you're saying something false. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, this has all been... I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to give correct answers to questions since I'm not an expert on these subjects. So this has all been structured so that any question you can ask, I can say, well, I will have to raise that with the aliens. <laughs> well, okay, let, let me try the question. <laughs> okay, so so if you just think uh, you you thought the aliens they recognize the meaningful sentences like there is a proof of infinity crimes, right? Uh, and then if you say okay, uh, just saying this assertion is true is just a shortcut for for the same for saying there is a proof. So, so what's uh, this uh, argument about then? Um, no argument. I'm, 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 I could be wrong on this, but let me try. Uh, so consider the following statement. Um, if A is true, um, let, let me know. If there's a proof of A, then A is true. Okay. My understanding is, now, now I'm, um, I might have to consult my alien friends before I say, my understanding is that, 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 that we, we can't prove that. That is, you take the statement, proof of A implies A is true. 
my understanding is that if, if we write that down as a as a, as, a, as an asser arithmetic assertion, we can't prove it. So um, I don't I mean I, I don't know if that's a response. Uh, the 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 the. Uh, See, you're, you're saying, so why, why don't we just say, use the word true to mean we have a proof? Um, okay, so I get, so then you would say that, it, that it's true that there's no largest prime, and it may be true that there is a largest prime. You'd be okay with that? Mm, yeah. Uh. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that the, that, that the aliens would claim that we can't have four and a half lives. With our margin, I think that, uh, that that the position would be that mathematics is simpler and clearer if you do it their way. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there'll be more discussion, so maybe we might talk them out of this position eventually. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm wondering if if the aliens who are listening to us. In the 1950s, when Mr. Tarski proved that uh, truth can be determined by a computer. Uh, well, I think I, 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 I suspect that they were, and they were very happy with that because they, they said, we're getting our comeuppance, right? We have these, 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 um, these emotional reactions, which we've sort of codified as grand levels of truth, and the, 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 it's, it, that, that wasn't a good plan right from the get-go, and that's, that's what Tarski is saying. So, so they would say, oh, great, maybe, maybe you'll come around to our view at some point. Uh, that, 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 I don't find it damaging to, have, to hold their view. I mean, they, 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 somehow these things being true is never actually used anywhere. It's just sort of hanging around in the background, making you feel good. And you, it's, it's not that hard, and once you get used to it, to just not do it anymore. It's a little bit like, it's a, it's a little bit like in quantum mechanics, the idea that, that, um, that, 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 that systems occasionally get into classical configurations is, is a kind of useful um, crutch, which is okay, maybe it doesn't cause a lot of damage, but eventually one can get rid of it and life is, 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 is easier and, and, and more pleasant. Um, maybe I can think of an example on the infinity. Suppose you took the view that, well, it's true we have these levels of infinity, but really, re really there's only, the, the, the infinity is day and there's only one of those things, and that's really the way it is. And this other is some sort of fine um, tuning of some kind. I can't state this well, but I'm trying to state the position that says you don't have to adjust your intuition to cardinality. You can get by with your old in intuition by just saying, well, we'll get a little vague on this at this point. You might be able to do that. And in fact, people did. But ultimately, I think we all agree, life is much better if you just get into the cardinality mood and face it and you change your intuition, and then the world is really simple. And you discover that you never really needed the idea that, that all infinities are the same. It was just sort of sitting in the cloud somewhere, it wasn't doing you anything for you anyway. And I'm trying to suggest that this notion of truth, I mean, whether the axiom of choice is true, I think um, we've made, pretty much made that tradition, uh, and that transition. I mean, I think that, that most people would take the, the, the I, I'm really not sure, but I, I hope that most people would take the position that th th there's no issue to discuss here, discuss here. There's no way you could ever say, well, the axiom of choice is, is false because here I found an example of these sets, blah, 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 or the axiom of choice is true, or here I've proven that. It was, <laughs> So it's better just to say, just to sort of leave it in the cloud and not really get involved, not a, sort of apply truthiness to that. And if you start even with elementary things like will this program hold, once you're sort of on the slippery slope of truthiness, you slide right down um, 
what other choice is there? Uh, um, you could say, well, okay, I'll just decide. As, uh, it makes me feel good to say truth for all these other things. And I agree, I sort of slide down, but I, I won't get too excited about that. I guess you could take that position. Um, you, you sound a lot like set theorists who say, well, if you believe this infinite cardinal exists, then this infinite cardinal exists, et cetera, et cetera. They, they never make assertions about truth either because they have no access, they access to it. They're just constantly um, <laughs> finding consequences of things rather than truth. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, I, I have a, my sense is that mathematics is moving in this direction anyway. I mean, I, 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 that, that I, I remember having this uh, some maybe 10 years ago, I, I uh, talked with somebody who works on these kinds of things, a discussion about whether piano was consistent. And um, I'm not sure that I would be able to have that discussion with anybody now. I, I, I think that the, that the idea that, that um, is piano consistent is a real question. I think that is starting to fade. I think we are moving in the direction of the aliens. I'm just, I'm advocating, well, not me. I mean, the aliens are advocating a sort of radical departure where you just take a thing whole hard rather than try to do a piecemeal. That's the, that's at least, they don't actually care whether we do it or not, but the, 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 well, that's the, um, and, and it's very hard, I think it's very hard for us to defend our position. We can't explain it to anybody. We've had earlier situations where this sort of thing happened and we learned it wasn't easy to switch our intuition and we did it and now we're all much happier about it. Um, we, we, we run down slippery slopes with it. Maybe it's better just to bite the bullet and get rid of it. I, I remember a paper, you, you sent me a paper on, on I don't know, on well, some of these subjects. And I, I remember reading the abstract, which said, this is true, and this is true, and this is not true. I must say, I couldn't even understand it, because I just don't know what all this true means. I would much rather they say, Say here's a, here's a sentence for which we can, that we can prove in piano arithmetic, and here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one, and here's one we we we, we don't have a proof yet. I would feel much more educated if they would say that. And all I'm asking, I guess, is that they they rephrase things in that language, which I think. I don't know, it saves a lot of time. I mean, for example, there's a lot of discussion. When I read. There is some discussion of what Buddhist theorem means. People say it's quantum mechanics. People say people who are special were not mechanical, and so on. I, I, I don't find that, that discussion very attractive. Um, that it seems to me that what we're really saying is we have this notion of truth and we have uh, we have to we have to um, save it and therefore we'll throw out any any, any babies we, we need in order to with the bathwater in order to to somehow save this idea. It's so much easier just to give it up. Then there's nothing mystical about that. It's just a little sense. Oh, hold on. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> so I, I have a thought, um, which I think, I mean, what you're describing that the alien do to uh, write is seems very similar to, um, uh, I, 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 I forget the exact term that is given to this sort of constructivism, it may be, uh, it's not uh, pantheistic constructivism, but there's a term like that that folks like to use to describe this. Um, and. Okay. Um, but uh, the difficulty, in a sense, I would say, it seems to me that, I mean, your prior historical examples of adopting the standpoint, like, all rely on the fact that, like, okay, well, people really um, want to work with cardinality a lot, and therefore, and cardinal analysis, and therefore, it's very important to, you know, um, adopt that standpoint. Um, yeah. The difficulty that I believe people may run into or have run into is they might say this disambiguates certain um, sorts of things that are perceived to be confusing or paradoxical or whatever. However, I'm not interested in any of that. 
Right, just like one might say that, um, well, this quantum standpoint about the position of a particle really clears mm -hmm. things up if you're interested in quantum physics. But everything I'm interested in involves billiard balls, and so this just seems like a lot of work, which yields me no benefit. And I believe that that historically in the last period has, has been the obstacle to this in a way. And a lot of people say, all of this is very fascinating, but only if you're interested in these weird phenomena anyway. So my suggestion is stop asking these questions. Well, I mean, you raise a good point. Uh, um, so far be it for me to tell people, well, you, you, you have to go to a lot of work to think about things in, other, in some other way when it's not going to do you any good. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if, if people who want to feel that particles have positions and don't deal with quantum mechanics, for example, billiard players, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go stand on a billiard table and say, well, wait a minute, you have to think about it in some other way. And people who, who are, aren't interested in levels of infinity but don't have issues that, for which that touches, again, I... I mean, it is a practical world, and, and if, if, if things are working for you, go for it. So I guess uh, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if you don't want to think about Gordon, for example, and I can't think of any terrific reason to do so, you could probably get along pretty well. I mean, you do have this slippery slope about um, the program halting, and then you slightly change the. But you can say, well, I don't want to deal with programs particularly anyway. Yeah, I, I guess I agree with you. There's no, there's no point in changing your 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 your, your position if if, it, if it's if it's uh, not doing you any good. Uh, anyway, I, I so sorry to be a bit of a downer there. I, I suppose I, I, I'm raising this as someone who thinks that what you've articulated is a pretty useful way to think about things, and I'm just sort of been you know pondering like, well, what what would be the accretion of factors that would you know make others say this actually is more useful to me, right, as opposed to just well, your point is very well taken. I mean, the the, the aliens are uh, their, their, their feelings are not hurt very easily, so I, we're, we're free to. To argue against them in any way we want, so, and I, I, I think that's a good point. I'm sure there are many other uh, sort of revolutions in thinking that we haven't discovered yet. We're getting along just fine without, and um, and uh, yeah, I don't know that we have to adapt every new um, um, fad that comes down the road. Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, by the way. <laughs> I should have, that, the term I was looking for, not pantheism, that's my own invention. Um, it, 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 I, I think these days they call it the mathematical multiverse. Is this idea that you all is sort of specified sort of under, you know, this set of rules or whatever, then this system does this, rather than, you know, saying there's a truth. Everything is sort of the yeah. multiverse that you pick. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I, 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 it wouldn't take much to convince me that there are pockets of aliens even on our planet. I, I mean, <laughs> not necessarily even um, descended from the other way, but arrived at this independently. I mean, my, my, my guess has, has probably has zero value, but I'm going to guess anyway. I'm guessing that 100 years from now, but, that's, well, that's too up. That 50 years from now, that, 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 that um, mathematics will simply be that way. This way and that'll be the end. Nobody will ever think about there's really, there's really the largest problem. That's my guess. Anyway, <laughs> let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Robert. It, it worked out perfectly. It really did. I don't think I've never tried to explain much to anybody's dog before, but uh, I, I, I said that's my takeaway from this talk is I'm going to start talking to dogs about math a lot more. And, uh, <laughs> well, <whatever. laughs> thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Very much.